Professor Bremont, did you, did you want to chime in on that? It's a good question. Yeah. Um, I certainly agree with Mr. Hitchens, but I'm not sure that altruism has given rise to any great art. I can't think of any at the moment, but perhaps I'm wrong. I, I was thinking about that question in light of the previous question. I was thinking about transcendence. And this, I'm just going to put this out there quickly and then sit down because this may be opening a whole new can of worms. But it seems to me that, that every age uh, to produce great art, or even great culture, even great everyday culture, has to have some sort of framework that provides that kind of transcendent experience. And, and that truly great art, truly great culture, even everyday culture, ha has to come from that. Now, we live in an increasingly secular world. So I, I think um, that the, uh, uh, the problems that Mr. Hitchens uh, complains of, um, I, I, I think, I hope, I believe that they are becoming less and less and less. But the question then becomes is, uh, what... Um, if, if religion, however you define it, is no longer providing that sort of transcendent motivation or framework, um, the reason why people make art, the, the motivation for art, the thing that gives meaning to art and culture, um, then what does for us? What does provide that, that kind of uh, transcendence? Um, let me just suggest that I think increasingly it's going to be the market. Uh, as, as global capitalism takes over culture, uh, worldwide, uh, like it or not, but I think I think that may be a, a new framework. And in a hundred years, people may be uh, discussing the extremism of, uh, of capitalism. So I'll just throw that out and then sit down. <laughs> that does lead to a whole, whole other series of questions. That's very provocative. Uh, um, okay, let me try and get somebody up top there. I'm not going to throw the mic up there, but you can just tell me. Yeah, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me try and uh, give, do that justice. Um, Mr. Hitchens, by the way, this questioner has traveled 500 miles from Washington, D.C. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit of an irony. Uh, his... Um, <laughs> uh, he mentions Thomas Paine and the notion that nothing could be more divine than the natural sciences. A question to both of you, how has religion, he sa says, potentially stifled the natural sciences? Um, well, everybody knows the story of, of what happened to people who tried to expand scientific knowledge. The more the sciences shed light, the less room there is for people to say, miracles can be prayed for that will achieve the same effect in healthcare, say. Or that bad miracles, bad supernatural, not supernatural, but bad events in the natural order, like hurricanes or earthquakes, are the product of sin. All the things that made religion possible in the years when it was building itself up are kicked away. Now, there is now a whole school of religious types who follow us around saying, ah, now we, we've stopped saying that the theory of relativity isn't true. We've stopped saying that the Big Bang would be a heresy. We've stopped saying that all species were created in the, at the same time and for the same reason. Instead, this just occurred to us, evolution is so intricate, so wonderful, so marvelous, so complex, it could only have been done by God. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> this is not really... This is not really a theory of knowledge, is it? It's, there's no kind of epistemology involved. It's just a catch-up. Um, and uh, uh, contemptible, I, I think. Where, that's where they have given in. Where they haven't, and a surprisingly large number of places, including in the United States, where they haven't, they, till, they still attempt to um, inhibit the circulation of those discoveries. And I think there's a final closing reason why it, un it unsettles them. There's nothing so much to do with scientific implications, it's this. If you take a look through the Hubble telescope at the photographs it's sending back, for example, or if you read a page of the work of Stephen Hawking, I can only read about one page of him a day and hope to make progress, you'll come across considerations that are so much more awe-inspiring, so much more overwhelming, so much more inclined to induce in you feelings of extreme modesty 
um, awareness of what should be your humility, and so much more grand and, and wonderful than anything that any religion could possibly come up with. Do you know about the event horizon, can I just tell you? I mean, someone, I'm sure many people in the audience do. It's the lip of the black hole. Um, if you travel towards a black hole, you went over its lip, as it were, in, into it. We have to do this in pictographic terms, of course, because we're so limited in our language. As you went over that, it's called the event horizon. You would, in theory, be able to see the unfolding of the, of the past and the unfolding of the future as well as the present. I say in theory because even if you could get there, you probably wouldn't have time uh, in which to do that. But it's a thought. And actually one of Hawking's colleagues has said, two of them, if he ever finds out that he's terminally ill, um, that's the way he wants to die. Now you look at that, the, the incredible majesty of that thought and that spectacle. And you set it against what? The burning bush? I don't think so. It makes, it makes the, 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 the so-called miraculous super, supernatural achievements of religion seem what they are, completely trivial. The products of village squabbles in the, in the Bronze Age. So of course there is a, 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 an enduring incompatibility between those two ways of looking at the world. Okay, uh, I, I, thank you for that, Mr. Hitchens. Okay, uh, two more, and then we, um, I'm going to come to this man, because he's got a very strident... Uh, uh, yeah, let's... Yeah, go, go, can, can you... Uh, do you want to... Can you get down here? And I'll give you the last question. I'll go to this woman here. Everyone says this, but this... Everyone says this, but this is for both speakers. In a discussion that we've heard so much about the dangers of extremism, I would like to hear more about tolerance. Start with you, Professor Remick. Well, I think tolerance can, can, be, it can be a good thing. It can also be very much misplaced. I think, the, I think rather than, than tolerance, I, I'd rather have wisdom because I think wisdom will do what tolerance would otherwise do and um, again back to the hobby horse I rode in here on I, I think that a rhetorical training uh, is is more inclined to provide that wisdom where if one hears what we might call an intolerant statement just saying to yourself well be tolerant be tolerant because perhaps it's, a sta it's perhaps the statement is true there are some things of which we ought not to be tolerant. I think it's a wiser course of action to ask what ought we to affirm and what ought we to critique. And I think that will produce a better world. I think there's an indissoluble element of um, patronization and uh, condescension in the idea of tolerance. I mean, would you like it if I said, I'll tolerate you? Would you not feel, well, thanks a lot? Who asked you? <laughs> Do I need your permission um, uh, to, to exist or to say what I say? No, I think I, I would rather assume you're right to do that. Then it would depend what you said. Um, it's like being forgiven. Mother Teresa once said she forgave me. I thought, that's supposed to sound nice, but I didn't ask her for forgiveness. Hadn't actually done anything that required me to do so. And I'm not completely sure what gives her the power to bestow it in any case. Again, a tremendously serene condescension on the part of someone who wasn't as modest as she looked. You notice, by the way, that the most faithful people are the ones who go on the most about humility and being how humble and how modest they are. I said, no, no, just fine, don't pay any attention to me. I'm just going around doing God's work all the time. I'm, on, I'm carrying out his instructions. It's okay, I haven't just, I'm not getting in your way. Um, that's not very modest, is it? There's no humility there. That's a tremendously arrogant claim. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth um, I, the great Queen Bess, an attempt was made to put an end to religious warfare in Britain. In other words, the killing of Christians by Christians over what Christianity was or was not. And the legislation that tried to bring it to an end was called the Toleration Act. 
um, whereby some sects of Christianity were told that henceforth they'd be tolerated. Again, I think that's an insufferable way to be spoken to. And just because I don't want to and refrain from joining in the applause for the much too inclusive uh, statement that Professor Brummett just made. Um, I would say that many statements made by the religious are intolerable. I don't think it is tolerable that people be told, excuse me, that children be told by their parents or by their teachers that if they don't obey certain religious precepts, they will go to hell or that they can congratulate themselves that they won't go to hell, but that their neighbors or schoolmates who practice another religion most certainly will. I think that's intolerable. I think it's antisocial. I think those who say, as was said about 10 years ago, uh, to Americans by Osama bin Laden, we can always call off this attack on you, if you like. We can cease denouncing you as a bunch of um, of corrupt hedonists run by the international Jewish conspiracy given to full-time offenses against chastity, um, the vermin and scum of the earth, meet to be killed, fit to be killed any time or any place in the name of God. We can always call it off if you'd like to become Muslim. Then we can accept you completely. And he's repeatedly said in his broadcasts, which I'm glad to see have now come to a terminus, that that, that showed how broad-minded he was. After all, he said, I warned them and I gave them an offer. They could prostrate themselves in front of me or they could be considered legitimate targets. Well, that's his view of being tolerant, and that's my definition of the intolerable. 